Hi, welcome to the Oh Amazing Way. I'm Beth Reese, and I am so excited today to welcome my dear friend and colleague, Alan Steelman. Alan, how are you today? I'm doing great, and I'm equally excited to be your guest. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, thank you. So uh, normally we get started. We hop in with a little like dropping into mindfulness together. Um, and we're going to do that. And then I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about Alan's background and why he's just the amazing guest to have on this podcast. And then we'll hear a little about his story. We'll take a break. And then he has some just so much going on. He's so out there. You're so out there, Alan, making a difference. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about it, share it with our listeners. And so for those of you listening, let me just say part of the conversation today is really both between Alan and I, like two people on one career path and like screech, the world <laughs> really call, has called us, right, to do something a little different than we thought. So for those of you listening, really pull this to you and be looking in your own life for what are those ways and places the universe is calling to you to maybe step out of your comfort zone and make a difference? Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and take a moment and even just take your hands if you're not driving and just shake them a little bit. We're just going to shake off maybe the, I like to call it the spilt milk of the day. Anything that's like that we're in a trance about that's looping that has us not in the present moment. Or maybe it's like a rabbit hole about our shopping list, our to-do list. And then let's gently rest our hands in our lap. And if it's available to you, softly close your eyes. And if you'll let your mouth open just a bit to let your jaw relax. No clenching jaws right now. Save that for later, just kidding. And then really get present to who you're being in this moment. And if you're sitting, like really know that you're sitting. And on your next breath in, really notice that you're breathing. And don't do anything to change your breath, just notice your body breathing. If you take your mind's eye to your eyes, let your eyes relax in their sockets. Take your mind's eye to your inner ears, let your inner ears relax. Take your mind's eye to your shoulders and on your next breath out, let your shoulders soften away from the ears. I know sometimes our shoulders have that codependent relationship with our ears, but let's let them separate for just a little bit. And taking your mind's eye to your mouth, can you turn the corners of your mouth up just a bit, creating a gentle smile. And as you exhale out, flutter your eyes open and ah, boy, it's amazing. And just, you know, 30, 60 seconds, how whatever was happening a minute ago is like poof or sort of poof gone. And we can be right exactly. here in the present. Well, I have to confess, I always have a bit of performance anxiety starting a podcast and it's all gone, Beth. Well, there you go. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you know, performance and I, and I love you're just jumping right in and being so authentic right away. I hear you. And those, you know, so much during the day or whatever we encounter, if we are really, when we, when we choose to be connected to our body, we can notice that Often through the day, we have these body sensations that sometimes are like nervousness or excitement or sadness. And to just go, oh, that's what I'm feeling right now and just invite it to be there. And then right. really just well, be moving forward. And, 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 and your breath, our breath is our yellow brick road. Ah. In, the, in, my, in my first book, as you know, I use the Wizard of Oz story to illustrate that uh, it was really the story of our lives. And if you remember 
the yellow brick road was the path to the Emerald City where troubles drop like lemon drops and the sky's always blue and the birds always singing. And uh, so our own Emerald City is within us and it can always be accessed through what we just did. That's our, that's our yellow brick road to our very own Emerald City. So I love great that. I love way. it. And yes, such a great book. And I can't, we're going to dive more into that in the second half. And um, so really this first half, we're going to really hear a little bit about your personal, your personal story of how you came to find mindfulness, yoga on and off the mat. And for the listeners, um, what I often tell a story about the first time or a time when I've met my guest and, um, and Alan and I had the pleasure of meeting while I was working for the Crow Museum of Asian Art. And, um, but really the story one, what I want to share with you is the 17 minutes before we started recording this podcast. So Alan and I are both hosts of our own podcasts. And as we came on into the space, we were having audio and speaker challenges. And, you know, that doesn't normally happen. And I can imagine, I don't know about you, Alan, but I can imagine like years ago, that would have, I, I could have just gotten super frustrated and been like, you know what, we just can't do it today. Right. Well, Murphy, Murphy, Murphy always shows up at one place or another. And uh, to underline your point, uh, I may uh, have been and continue to be, hopefully mostly in private moments, a frequent user of the F-bomb when Murphy shows up. Me too. High five. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I thought about writing a third book called Yoga, Meditation, and the F Bomb: Your Path to a Calm Mind. But anyway, we not, neither of us, for our listeners and viewers, dropped in the F bombs during that whole technology challenge we just went through and uh, getting up and rolling on this. So we, we were both pretty proud of ourselves, I think. Right. And just, I mean, we even sort of joked, like, it's a good thing we know how to breathe, but there was never, there was never a moment when even I, when I kept checking in with my body, like, am I starting to feel frustration? I'm not. And I think part of that is because I intuitively knew that you were steady as well. And so really right. to your, um, to your practice of being calm and steady, I, I thank you. So friends, let me tell you a little about this completely amazing person and friend of mine, Alan Steelman. He is a former member of the US Congress uh, from here in Texas, former vice chairman of Alexander Proudfoot Company, and former chairman of the Dallas Council on World Affairs. He is a graduate of Baylor University, holds an MLA degree from Southern Methodist University, and was a resident fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. He's also a certified yoga instructor, right? Like if, it, if that isn't all enough, like running companies and being a U.S. congressman, he's like, let me, let me just dive in here and well, become a yoga instructor, right? You know, we, we all aspire to be historical figures. And of course, this doesn't rise to the level of Gandhi or Roosevelt or anything like that, but I am the only former member of Congress who has written a book on yoga and who's a certified yoga instructor. So that, there. That's so <laughs> badass. Sorry, I had to say that. Uh, Alan's career in politics was marked with distinction. He the, was the youngest member of the U.S. Congress when he was elected. Time Magazine named him one of the top 200 young emerging leaders in America. And in endorsing his reelection, the Time, Dallas Times Herald called him one of the best ever sent to Congress from Texas. His global business career, which spanned 35 years, included an eight-year stint in Singapore as president of the Asia-Pacific Reason for Alexander Proudfoot. He was born in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. He's married to his wife, Susan, and is the father of five children and the stepfather of two. Shoof! Slacker, just kidding. That, that is so, and, and let me just say, like, thank you for your service in Congress. I can only imagine, you know, the mindful opportunities there to practice. <laughs> yes. And Alan, I know in your book um, and in your life, you have experienced anxiety and stress, um, perhaps danced in the realm of addiction. Um, that's part of what you talk about in being in the fast lane. And I wonder if you would take us and share with us, like what life was like for you before, before your mindfulness practice, before your right. yoga on and off the mat practice, what was life like? And then right. 
what happened? What was the calling to dive into this world? And what's life been like since then? So I'd love to hear that story. Well, did we, we all remember Paul Harvey and his famous, and now the rest of the story. So right. the, the, the backstory to all you just went through is that, um, so I, I grew up in Arkansas, as you said, my dad was a member of the Steelworkers Union. And the, uh, the company, we grew up, we lived in this little town in Arkansas, Arkadelphia, midway between Little Rock and Texarkana. And uh, the company went on strike and was on strike for four years from my eighth grade through my 12th grade. So we were living hand to mouth, trying to, living on unemployment insurance. And my mother uh, got a job at the local garment factory. Now that was all difficult from an economic standpoint, but uh, to further really complicate matters, particularly for my parents, my brother uh, was, was diagnosed as being bipolar. And actually that was uh, an, undiagnosed, an undiagnosed condition at the time. So uh, today it would be, would be called manic depression or be referred to as bipolar. But uh, in a little town in Arkansas, when my youngest brother, uh, who later committed suicide, by the way, uh, just couldn't go to school, couldn't come out of his room. And my parents, already dealing with the economic hardships that I just uh, mentioned, also had this to deal with. And you've probably heard the adage, and it certainly proved, has proven true in my case, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Mm. Uh, so as a parent, you can just imagine dealing with the economic uh, hardship along with my, my, my brother's condition. And as it turned out, uh, I learned later that uh, there was really a uh, bipolar gene on the male side of my family. Three of my father's five brothers had it, and my brother had it. And by sheer luck of the genetic, genetic lottery, I didn't get it. But uh, it was, you know, by, by, by pure luck. So uh, to segue now to uh, life after that, so you've probably heard the old adage, none of us ever get out of high school. You know, as long as we live, none of us ever get out of high school because whatever we went through, good, bad, or ugly, uh, basically gets hardwired. And so I can remember the nightmares that I had in high school, uh, a lot of it due to what I just mentioned regarding the home life. And my parents, by the way, in spite of all this, were, gave me unconditional love. Even when I didn't deserve it and needed to be called for things, they, didn't, they never did it. So that was, that was the great blessing. But I can remember the, the two nightmares. One was uh, being underwater and gasping for air and trying to swim my way to the top. And I just never could get there and waking up in a cold sweat. And then the other one was living in this little town. I worked at the movie theater downtown. And the other nightmare was that somehow I ended up on Main Street, no clothes on whatsoever, and trying to find my way back through these alleys and behind the trees to get home. And so I, I carried those two nightmares well into college and even, even later into that. And even still today, I still have a scarcity mentality uh, uh, coming out of, that, uh, out of that high school experience. So anyway, um, to, to kind of move, move forward a little bit further. So I go to Baylor on an athletic scholarship and uh, decide I want to live in Texas. And I was so driven, Beth, I think as I look back on uh, the things that I've done in my life, always driven to prove myself, uh, a lot of it having to do with that high school experience. And so, you know, why would, any, why would anyone need to prove that they're okay by doing something as dramatic as running for the U.S. Congress at the age of 29? But that's what I did because, you know, the, you remember the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay? Yes. <laughs> which, which I just loved and was so so inspired by. Well, I was not okay. You know, I was good at faking it till I made it, but I was not okay, again, back to the high school experience and the experience at home. So what better way to prove that you're okay than to run for Congress against a five-term incumbent and go mano a mano and have more people vote for you than vote for him, which they did. So obviously I was, you know, I, one of the greatest – experience of my life, but when I look at the psychological motivation behind that, a lot of it had to do with having to prove myself that I was, you know, and to others that I was okay. And you know, Alan, I, I just want to pause real quick here and really, and again, invite our listeners to really pull that, that piece of your story towards them, and, and, and certainly for me, in thinking about 
what motivates us to be who we be and do what we do. And of course, remembering we're human beings, not human doings. Um, and, a lot of, and a lot of us get in that cycle of do, 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 and that sort of thing. But thinking about, um, and the motivation for who we become, like it doesn't have to be something, um, or often it's a double-edged sword is what I'm getting at. So that sometimes we're doing things or being in a way to overcome a, a fear or um, that sense of like, am I enough, right? And, and to see it doesn't make it wrong, but I love how you're in this space in your life, Alan, where now you can sort of step back and I really invite everybody to take a step back and look at your life and the choices that we make and, um, and how, how a past decision can impact who we are today, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Beautiful. Exactly. I just really, that's so... That's so tender and telling, Alan. I just really wanted to underline that. Um, so I would, so but to one of your other questions, uh, as a part of the uh, intro into this segment, you, you mentioned uh, or you asked about the stress and anxiety. So, so the way I, uh, so I went to college on an athletic scholarship. And so I've always been, it was then and remain physically fit. I did not appreciate the difference between physically fit and having you know the correct blood pressure readings and all that, and being fit of mind and spirit, and so I would cope with all the stress and the anxiety of "Am I enough?" to your last point by going out and running five miles and uh, uh, you know doing things to cope with the stress. And by the way, you, as all of us who run and exercise, know you do get a good endorphin uh, zap with a five-mile run. Uh, and when we get into yoga, there are several more brain chemicals you get with that, which we'll cover later. But so um, I, I would run to deal with the stress and anxiety. Now, you mentioned addiction. You know, I never, uh, I, I grew up in this very strict Baptist family. There was never alcohol in the house. There was never tobacco and so forth. So I never developed any any taste for that. But eating. So my, my nickname in college was GOAT, G-O-A-T. Now, what are GOATs famous for? Eating everything inside, right? So uh, great. <laughs> I, like, I like to tell people it really meant greatest of all time, but not really. It meant goat because I ate so much. But because my metabolism was still that of a 22-year-old in college, and I was running, and as you know, most of us have experienced, you hit 45, at least as a man, and your metabolism just dies dead in this track. So even though I was still, even at age 45, well into my business career then, and flying all over the world and living on airplane food and dealing with jet lag and all the stressful things that go with that, I would go run, but my metabolism had, had died. And so, uh, you know, I gained a lot of weight. And um, so I, I, I discovered, unfortunately, much later in life than I wish I had, that there is true magic in mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness being an umbrella term for both yoga and meditation. Uh, the the stressful mind or the agitated mind as Patanjali referred to it is really what drives any addictions any of us have. And when my mind started to really calm down due to my practice of yoga and meditation, it, miraculously my appetite for the copious amounts of food also disappeared. So, you know, and it wasn't that I was on some strict regimen or diet to eat less, it just, the, 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 the hunger just disappeared. So, you know, I was able to eat much more moderately uh, just by the fact that the agitated mind that we're all afflicted with uh, was much less agitated due, due to my practice of yoga and meditation. Yeah, that's so great. And that, the thing about the agitated mind is, like, I won't, can only speak for myself. I feel like I was conditioned to, um, and this may ring true for a lot of people, that the agitated mind, that mind or that's in a loop and like thinking it's like, we want to push it away, right? Like I shouldn't be thinking that I should be doing this instead of saying, Oh, wow, I'm agitated right now. Okay. Right. Right. And getting that's all it is. And as soon as we invite that agitation, right. To come sit for tea, as I like to say, as others like to say, it's, it kind of, it doesn't have that hold over us. It stops running the show. And then we can really, as you're pointing to, to see, so what am I using as a distraction 
so that I don't have to deal with my agitated mind? And is it, you know, picking up my phone every five minutes and checking to see if I have one more like on Instagram or Facebook? Um, is it eating? Is it drinking? Um, is it like, what is it that I'm using in my life to, to like push that away? And I love how you're, you really were able to see for you, um, how it was a combination of, of food and exercise. But then at some point you also started really pulling exercise and yoga towards you. And, and what I heard you say is that you saw how it helped to calm your mind and calm that agitation down. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? How your life shifted with the mindfulness? Well, my, actually my, my youngest son uh, is the one who got me into yoga and meditation about uh, 10 years ago. As I said, I wish I had discovered it much earlier. And he kept telling me that, and he's also very physically fit. He kept saying, there's really something very different about the way that, that, that I feel. It's not just my physical side, but it's a much calmer mind and the anxiety is much less. So I said, okay, I'll try it. Now, frankly, I tried it mostly because I wanted to be able to touch my toes again. After all those years of running and tight hamstrings and tight uh, calves and all, just being able to touch my toes again would have been uh, a reward for doing that. But about six or seven months, I started to notice, man, this it really is, there's something magic happening here. And then when I started to research the impact on this, uh, I, I learned about, you know, we were really born with what I refer to as a, a Walgreens or a CVS in our heads. You know, we, we are born, we we're born with uh, four magical feel-good chemicals, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins. And a practice of yoga and meditation really stimulates the vagus nerve spelled V-A-G-U-S, but pronounced like Las Vegas, which then distributes that Walgreens in our brain all the way from head to toe. And that's the calming, that's the magic in yoga and meditation. And you know, Beth, you, you referred to this a moment ago to uh, all of us uh, finding various ways to cope. In my case, it was eating, and others it's pills and alcohol and uh, digital addiction. And, you know, these are really, uh, in, in my first book, I refer to these as the false wizards. You know, the, the, as we all remember, Dorothy and the Tin Man and the, and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion thought there was a magical wizard over the rainbow there that was going to get Dorothy and Toto back to Kansas, uh, give the Tin Man a new heart to be in love again, uh, give the Scarecrow a brain to make wise choices, and give the Cowardly Lion courage. And he turned out to be a wrinkled up little old man who couldn't do anything for them. And the lesson was, we have within us already everything we need. And so... Pills and alcohol and eating and all these things are really false wizards that we all are tempted to use in order to cope with the stress and anxiety of life in the digital age, the age in which we live. I love that. That is such a great and easy analogy, right? Because it's such a great story. Um, and to the point also, and I think of uh, that, the Wizard of Oz, and also um, just that concept also that we're often driven to seek outside of ourselves that wizardness right and and the answer yeah. and lo and behold it's it's with us all the time right? right and to really just start to to be able to to be with what's so and what's there how we find that the magic we're looking for has been right with us all the time all exactly. the time beautiful well That's alan I, yeah That's go ahead and it's accessible in exactly the way you started this whole program off through our, our breathing. It is. It really is. And uh, this is great. Well, Alan, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back. I want to hear more about the book, this book, more about your next book, and then what you're up to with your, your nonprofit, your organization, in terms of really like taking this work, answering your calling, and really being out there in the world creating transformation. So we'll take Very a quick good. break and we'll come back and hear about that. We'll be right back. Very good. 